If you open your Bibles again to Acts chapter 6, I know that probably to many people, preaching on church leadership structure is at best boring and at worst a waste of time. Who really cares how the church is structured as long as the leaders are loving the sheep, as long as uh, they love the Lord, they maintain integrity and humility? Well, admittedly, church polity is not a major doctrine of the Christian faith, such as Reformation would be about, uh, and the deity of Christ, sola fide, sola scriptura. There is room for disagreement among churches and Christians in this area, church government. We don't need to breach fellowship over a doctrine like this. This New Testament teaching, and it is New Testament teaching, does however, carry some implications for the way a church is able to do its ministry. Different practices have different consequences. Alexander Strauch, in his book, many of you are familiar with it, Biblical Eldership, writes, for many people, the issue of church government is as irrelevant as issue as the color of the church pews. Indeed, for many people, the color of the church pews inspires greater interest The average church member's disinterest in how the church is governed needs to be challenged, however. Church organizational structure matters because structure determines how people think and act. Ultimately, structure determines how things are done in the local church. He continues to write, I find it ironic that some evangelical leaders in America are more concerned about the structure of the United States government than the structure of the local church. Well, he was writing about elders. Our text in Acts 6 today touches on those who were designed to support the elders of the local church and how proper church government actually helps to advance the Word of God. That might be a new thought to you. Advancing the Word of God should be important to all believers, and if church structure can do that, then it is related to something that is important. As we read chapter 6 in the book of Acts verses 1 through 7. See if you can find that connection between the way the church is structured and the advance of the Word of God. Acts 6, 1 to 7. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So, the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word." The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them, the Word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. This text actually has an awful lot in it. Um, I I usually, when I approach a text, I think, well, what are we going to preach on when we get here? And then as I get into the text more deeply, the question more is, what am I going to cut out? because there's so many topics that are touched on here. Well, we can clearly see how assistance to the apostles were chosen. Here we learn of the work that they were charged to do, the character that was required of them, and then in verse 7, the result of this advancement in church structure. These seven men became an important addition to the leadership structure of this 
mega church in Jerusalem. So much so, they are respectfully referred to as the seven. While these seven men were not deacons per se, it says that they were appointed to a specific task here. The office of deacon had not yet developed in the church this early. They're never referred to as deacons. Certainly the work that they do, the position that they hold, parallels to some degree that of deacons that we read about later in the development of the church. It even foreshadows, we might say, the emergence and necessary emergence of a separate office, not just an office of pastor, elder, but an office of a deacon, a servant, as the word means, that would come about later in the church. Many believe that this appointment of the seven set a logical precedent which made room for that office of deacon later to develop, to naturally arise. Each local church would grapple with the growing amount of ministry that they would have. They would look at what the Lord had called the elders and pastors to do, and they realized that the rest could not just be handled by volunteers, could not just be assumed that it would be accomplished, that there was a secondary office that was necessary to please the Lord and carry out the ministry in a God-honoring way. So this text is suitable for probing the office of the deacon and the, the rationale for that office, the results of that office. We will, of course, need to go to other New Testament texts and bring in that missing information to round out our understanding. But once we put the whole picture together, I'm hopeful that we will understand and better value the role of deacons in the local church. I also think that this text sheds some light on how deacons can be selected and how then deacons can be appointed to their service. For a deacon support structure cares for the people in the church. It helps to keep the unity of the church. Actually, we'll see that here. It even allows the elders to focus on their calling. And what is that? The Word of God and prayer. Well, in this historical account, we see three natural divisions to the text. First, we see the problem that develops. That's in verse 1. Next, we see the solution. Most of the text is about the solution. That's verses 2 through 6. And then we see the result. The problem, the solution, and the result to that. Today, we're going to take a look at the problem, maybe begin a little bit on the the solution. First, look at verse 1 again and the problem. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, we haven't heard about a complaint arising inside of this church so far. Everything has been wonderful with this church. I mean, this church witnesses, this church gives, this church worships, this church is devoted to the apostles' doctrine, this church had miracles, this church was growing, this church was having an impact, they were holy. Everything that you would want a local church to be And to do, so far, we've seen this marvelous mother church, this marvelous example of a loving, holy, maturing church. It's been everything for us. We've been feasting off of their example for five chapters. And then we hit chapter 6, and a complaint arises that immediately lets us know was not a perfect church, was not a perfect church. The context of this problem is that when the saints are increasing in number, Luke makes it very clear that this arose as the saints were increasing in number. The opening words relate this incident to the context previous to this in chapters 4 and 5, I think, namely the arising of persecution against the church and the explosive growth of the Jerusalem church. It was not growing moderately or fastly. The way it was just growing explosively. In chapter 6, we're still very early in church history, probably in the mid-30s A.D., three to five years, something like that, after the start of the church on the day of Pentecost. So just keep that in mind. This local church is dealing with remarkable growth. That's the context of the problem arising. In fact, the passage begins and ends with a note about the explosive numerical growth of the church. Luke has shown great interest in the growth 
of the church and the spread and the increase of the gospel. Even before we got to this text, he's been making mention of it. After this text, he will again make comment about the word kept increasing and spreading. Acts chapter 12, verse 24. Acts chapter 19, verse 20. It is a church growth passage. If people wanted to know what is proper church growth and what what is it that should supply proper church growth, this is a great passage to turn to. But it also is a passage about church governance. And it reminds us that despite the attempts on the part of the Jewish leaders to bottle up the Word of God, remember we talked about that in chapter 5, to imprison the apostles, to, to kill them, to outlaw the gospel, to intimidate them by flogging them. All of those attempts to bottle up the Word of God, to keep the gospel from going out, it didn't work. The Word of God won out. The Word of God spread. The Word of God burst out of all the seams and it spread from heart to heart. It grew. And because it grew, that should thrill us. It should always be exciting when we see the Word of God spreading to people. That should be what we're about. We should be excited when we see the gospel spreading to new regions and people receiving the Lord. That should be something that motivates us. Yet church growth presents itself with problems, and you see the problems. It's not just that they had a whole bunch of more congregants, a bunch of new members, the rapid growth gave them very little time to make adjustments in how they did church. But what you need to understand is the rapid growth for this church was the will of God. The will of God caused other things to happen in the church and to bring out inadequacies, yes, even problems. God expects us to understand that the church is not ours. The church is Jesus Christ's. And the church is not a static organization. It's a living, growing organism. And as it grows, that pleases God, that glorifies Jesus Christ. As it expands in the new territories, as more people become obedient to the faith, that pleases Jesus Christ. That pleases the head of the church. It should be something that pleases us. But as it grows, we shouldn't say, no, 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 we don't want to grow because it'll cause problems. We need to embrace the problems of growth as the will of God and make the adjustments as we need to. We make adjustments on the go. We trust God will supply needs. Much like what Jesus Christ taught his disciples when they were out in the wilderness and did not expect 5,000 people to follow them into the wilderness. And, And Jesus in John 6 turns to Philip and says, you buy them something to eat. And Philip, I don't know what he was thinking, but he must have blew a gasket And he was like, where are we going to get food for 5,000 people out in the wilderness? All we have is this lad's fish and bread. And Jesus taught them a lesson about ministry. You don't need anything other than me. You have me. And with God, things that seem impossible are not impossible. And he multiplied the loaves. That's the same attitude every local church should have. Not that new people or growth is a problem, but that with the problems, God will show himself to be God and he will make provisions. I think personally, I mean, you maybe don't think and live and breathe church seven days a week like I do, but I think it's helpful that Luke records such a big administrative problem right here. I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy about that because sometimes we have too rosy a view of the early church and we forget they were people just like us. They had problems. They had prejudices. They had ways in which they operated. They, they had difficulties that needed to be solved. They needed meetings. They had conundrums. It did cause them some degree of internal consternation. And here is one. It's not caused by the growth of the church per se, but the growth of the church made it harder to manage everything that was going on. And human hearts, being what they are, are not always looking after other people that are not like them. And so the problem happened. I know that sometimes people have complaints here about things that go on at Hope. Why isn't this better managed? Why wasn't this event better organized? Hey, I've got five ideas how you can improve such and such. Often what we need are not more ideas. We need more volunteers to make things work. But this kind of a thing happens in all churches. It may happen more in growing churches because they have to make adjustments, especially when growing churches have not adequately made provisions for their leadership then the problem emerges even more. Growth is a blessing. 
The book of Acts makes that clear. But it's a blessing that forces churches to strategize, to plan, to pray, and to adapt. For some people, with limited vision and not a true heart for the spread of the gospel or the priorities that Jesus gave to his church, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, right? They would rather their church remain small. I was talking to a pastor recently, and he was like, my church doesn't want us to grow. What do I say to them? And his heart was broken. Well, they have to learn to deal with growing pains, and that's why they don't want to grow. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build what? My church. It's his church. He said it. He said we would would witness And then he would grow his church. And that's what we're reading in the book of Acts, Jesus building his church. In the parable of the mustard seed, in in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus predicted that the kingdom of heaven, though starting with a very small band of disciples, would grow and grow and become so large it would become a benefit to so many others. Jesus said his church would grow in size. And here, clearly, the disciples were increasing. This is the first use of the term disciple, mathetes, in the book of Acts. And we need to say a little something about that before moving on from that. Luke uses it many times when you read through his gospel for the followers of Jesus Christ. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. If if you're learning from Jesus Christ, then you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? You might even call it an apprentice in the case of the apostles. It's someone who sits at the feet of a teacher. Now, in the first century, the Jews would literally follow a teacher around. They called him a rabbi. A rabbi would go in various locations, and they would follow the rabbi. He would be inside. They would come inside and listen to what he had to say. He would go outside. He'd listen to what he had to say. John the Baptist had his own disciples. The Pharisees had disciples in different locations. Saul of Tarsus, we saw last time, was a disciple of Gamaliel, and rabbis would teach them in various settings. Whoever the teacher was, the intent of the disciple was, I want to learn from the teacher, and I want to become like that teacher. In Luke chapter 8, verse 9, it says that Jesus' disciples were asking him the meaning of a parable. Please teach us. They're acting like disciples. In Luke 11 and verse 1, the disciples saw Jesus praying, and they said, Jesus, would you teach us to pray? That's what disciples do. In Luke 22 and verse 39, it says, the disciples were following, walking behind Jesus, literally going to the Mount of Olives. That's what disciples do. They kind of walk along behind their teacher. When the teacher stops to teach, you know, they, they realize it's time to learn. Jesus has an object lesson. He points to a flower and he teaches. They learn. He holds up a coin and it's an object lesson. They learn. That's what they, that's what they did. But following Jesus was not like following any other rabbi. Following Jesus had a cost. That's why Jesus taught in Luke 14, verses 26 and 27, if anyone comes to me, now he's talking about a disciple, someone that comes to him to take him on as a teacher. If if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, He cannot be my disciple. Fit that into what people are being taught about Christianity today, right? You have to love yourself first, we're told. Jesus said, unless you hate and reject your life, you can't even be a disciple of mine. That's what it's going to cost you to follow me. It's going to cost you everything. Your closest, most treasured human relationships will be like hate compared to the love and loyalty you will show to me. And then he finished in verse 27. He said, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Some people want to say they're disciples of Jesus, they're believers in Jesus, but they're not following Jesus. They're not learning anything from Jesus. They're not even taking the time to open up their Bible and read it. They're not disciples of Jesus. You're not a disciple of Jesus if that's not how you're living. These guys were. And the number of disciples of Jesus were multiplying. They saw in Christ somebody that was worthy of giving up everything that they owned to follow him. That's how great Jesus Christ was. And please notice that all of the Christians 
were disciples. Do you see that? All of the Christians were disciples. All of them were to take their walk with Jesus seriously, most seriously. There is no more serious business you will be involved in than your discipleship to Jesus Christ. Some Christians don't realize this about themselves. Every believer is a disciple and is to be learning biblically from Jesus, particularly the doctrines of the apostles, and learn how to walk in the truth and how to live in their lives patterned by Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 makes this very point. It says, the one who says that he abides in Jesus ought himself to walk in the same manner that Jesus walked. That's the point of discipleship. 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than this than to hear of my children, John wrote, walking in the truth. When I hear about them walking in the truth, I'm like, that just, that, that just makes my heart as an apostle. That's discipleship. Christians are disciples, all of us. Disciples is just another way of saying believers. Unfortunately, there are just too many that call themselves believers, but they're not disciples. And what that really means is they're not what? They're not believers. But this was an explosive growth of disciples, and it caused a problem for the early church because disciples are not yet perfected. Would you agree? And I don't care how many sermons you've heard, you're not perfect yet. I don't care how many sermons I write, I'm not perfect yet. And we're not going to sit down and have one devotion and get perfected. I like what Dr. MacArthur says. He says, it's not the perfection of your walk that shows you're saved. It's the direction of your walk. What direction are you walking in? Are you following after Jesus or are you kind of just sitting there? We as disciples are still being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We should never expect perfection of ourselves. We should never expect, ah, here's the hard part, perfection of our brothers and sisters. If you can find something wrong with other people in this church, congratulations. They found something wrong with you. (laughs) We're all in process. That means we all have to be patient with one another. It's dangerous when we just sit And I'm not picking on you guys in the back row, but often it is the back row. Just sit in the back row looking for something wrong to happen in church. Did you see such and such today? I know. And off it goes. Well, that brings us to their problem. The problem was the Hellenistic widows were being regularly, it looks like, overlooked in the serving of the daily rations. These vulnerable, mostly older ladies were not having their needs met by this church. And that was a problem. Actually, it was a fairly big problem. Widows in that society were among the most needy of all people. Even in Old Testament times, God's law protected them along with orphans and aliens, not the aliens from outer space, people from other lands that were in their land, as the most vulnerable of all people. In Exodus 22:22, 22, 22, it simply commands, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. They were the easiest to pick on. Deuteronomy 10, 18, the Lord executes justice for the orphan and the widow. Deuteronomy 27.19 adds, Cursed is he who distorts the justice due an alien, orphan, and widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. No, I mean, that's what I said. (laughs) Moses had them agree verbally, Cursed is anyone who distorts justice to a widow. Welfare to the poorest was built into the law in the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 24, 21. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not go over it again. Don't go back over it a second time. It, what remains, shall be for the orphan and for the widow. 
In other words, after you get the first swipe, you get the best. It's your hard work. You deserve that. But don't go back and harvest the second time. Leave it for the poor. They'll come in and they'll pick up what they can get. Jesus echoed the teaching of the Mosaic law by condemning the religious leaders, the scribes, the Bible teachers. In Mark 12, 40, he said, they devoured widows' houses. What does that mean? Because the widows were vulnerable, they found a way in order to get the profits from their homes. They did it for their own gain. In James 1.27, it points out pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress. Visit them. Visit them. Be there for them. And when you visit, they usually you bring something with you, right? You didn't just visit and say hi. You came with hands or something in order to help them. And then it also says keep yourself unstained by the world. Don't get into all the, the dirt and sexual immorality of the world. That's true religion. Paul later would instruct the proper care for widows in the church in 1 Timothy 5. This was also part of the development that happened in the structure of the church. We're not going to get into that, but just mentioning 1 Timothy 5, it talks about the young widows in general were to remarry. The older ones were to prove themselves useful to the saints. In other words, old people were also supposed to be doing something for the brethren, And if they proved themselves useful, they were to be put on a list, a role, and then they were to be directly cared for by the church. There were probably quite a number of widows in this gargantuan local church. The diaspora, that is the distribution of the Jews that had been living in other lands besides Israel because they were taken off their land in the Old Testament, many of them as... As the men got older in age, they would say to themselves, I want, and I've always dreamed in my life, to go back to Jerusalem, and I want to die in Jerusalem. And they would come from the diaspora, different parts of the world, Africa, from Crete, from uh, the uh, Fertile Crescent, from Europe, and they would come back where they had synagogues. They'd come back to the land, and they would, uh, they would buy a home, or they would have some residence there in Jerusalem, and they would live there. But what would often happen is they would do that later in their life when they had the financial means to make that change, which means, as often is the case, the man dies before the woman, right? So they've moved back to Jerusalem. They're all happy about that. They want their grave to be near where the Messiah will be, right? Near the throne of David. And they would come back, and then they would die. And what would that leave behind in abundance? Widows. A lot of widows. So it's probable that there were a whole bunch of widows in this early church, and if they had been followers of Jesus, as these were, they would have been kicked out of their synagogues. They would have been ostracized by the Jewish leadership. Where would they go for help? They would turn to their church. So this was not a small problem. A church's heart, I think, can in part be measured by how it takes care of the least among them. Would you agree? Who is the most needy, genuinely needy, who's doing what they should be doing, right? You have to take care of yourself. You have to do the things you should be doing. And even after doing that, genuine needs, then how is the church mobilizing, organizing to meet those needs? I think that tells a lot about the character of a church. I really do. Those who have done what they're supposed to do in life But life threw them a curveball. Life now is hard for them. What do we do with them? Are we truly meeting? Not not to elevate their lifestyle, but to meet their, their needs. Those are the kind of people that the church should be looking after, I think. And I know you agree. But here, not all of them were being properly cared for. So a complaint arose from among the Hellenists that their widows, notice that, their widows, they felt these Hellenists as a subgroup inside of the larger church, and they had their widows, not the other widows. The other widows inside the church were being cared for, but not their widows. Do you see that? Their widows were being overlooked. Their widows were being neglected. Now, who were these Hellenistic believers? They were Jews who were Greek-speaking. They were not Gentiles. 
Most of them had probably come from the diaspora, as we mentioned before, and they had now come and they believed in Jesus, but they did not speak Hebrew as their native tongue. The Greek-speaking Jews formed little enclaves in Jerusalem. They even had their own synagogues. Later, we'll read about how Stephen, one of the seven, was part of that synagogue. You can look at verse 9. They had their own synagogue, so it would teach and speak in Greek. Now, as we know, when there are distinguishes that are made in languages, that also spills over into culture, right? It spills over into social distinctions and cultural distinctions. There can be misunderstandings from one group to another group because of the language barrier and because certain things are done in that culture that are different than the other culture. Now, uh, of interest to us should be that excavations have been done in the land of Israel and show the presence of Hellenistic synagogues and Jews there in the first century. Another archaeological tidbit that shows the firsthand eyewitness accuracy of Luke's account here. The Hellenists, by the way, are mentioned again in Acts 9.29. They're mentioned again in 11.20. One scholar suggests that Hellenists made up some 10 to 20 percent of the Jewish population living in Israel at that time. So in this mega church, they were a minority. Do you see that? They were a minority. And it is always easier, listen, it is always easier to overlook the needs of minorities, always. The majority can easily look at how things seem to be going just fine and not paying attention to it's not going fine for everybody. The majority can very easily overlook the minority, and that is exactly what happened in this church. The Hebrew-speaking believers may have assumed that everybody was being cared for. Maybe at first they were being cared for because there weren't that many of them. Maybe this had to do with the growth and there was more and more of them. The majority seem to have just kept going on week by week, doing their normal distribution of the goods to the widows, as if there was no problem. The complaint did not arise from the Hebrew-speaking Jews. The complaint arose from the Hellenistic Jews. There was a problem, but the problem was not something that they had imagined, the Hebrew Jews had not imagined yet. Even with the incredible display of love we read about earlier in Acts, Remember all the selling of the properties, bringing the proceeds and laying them at the feet of the apostles. The apostles were then to take them and to distribute them as everyone had need. Some in this congregation were quietly being discriminated against. Although the way it is written, it seems to be more of neglect than intentional bigotry. These poor widows were not getting their daily rations. Have you ever gone a day and had no food at all? Have you ever, I don't know if this just gave out or not, have you ever had a day where you had no food at all in your house? Have you ever been in a situation like that where there's no food at all in your home? And you're not sure where the food's going to come from the next day, right? Is this a big problem for you? This is a big problem. This is not where, you know, you, can, you, can, you have no food in the refrigerator, but you can run out to the grocery store and get a few more and stock it again, right? Hey, honey, it's time to go to the grocery store again and the stock up again. No, this is where they don't have means to get their food. So this was a problem. This mattered to these widows. The daily rations that were given out would include food, first and foremost, sometimes also clothing or monies that would be needed for other uh, necessary products. Dr. Daryl Bach in his commentary, right, he comments that the practice appears to have been analogous to the Jewish system of once a week distribution of food and clothing called kupa and a daily meeting of more urgent needs. There was a one where if someone was an alien and they had immediate need and they just would get They'd get a provision for one day. They had that. But where there were regular needs and people needed regularly to get some kind of uh, uh, foods and monies, they would come and the Jews themselves, not the Christians, but the Jews would have a distribution to their needy people, including their widows. Dr. Ben Witherington, in his socio 
rhetorical commentary refers to the Mishnah of the Jews having these two distributions to the poor. The Christians were probably excluded from this daily dole of food by the Jews, and so the church took on something that mirrored that and then would provide for their own people. The church was not in business to make everybody rich or to try to make everyone have the same standard of living. That was not the goal. This, again, was not socialism. It was to give everybody what they needed, not what they wanted. Again, it looks like there was no ethnic malice here, just poor administration spurred on by favoritism. And so, a complaint arose, and it arose against the Hebrew Jews. They were the majority in this church. A complaint, you know, is usually a bad thing. The word gagusmas means grumbling, murmuring. You know what the Word of God says about that? Do all things without what? Grumbling or disputing, Philippians 2.14, one of the memory verses the men are trying to work on. 1 Peter 4.9, be hospitable to one another without what? Complaint. You know, people come in, they mess up your carpet, they eat, they, eat, they, they went to the wrong refrigerator and they got the good stuff off that you didn't offer them, and they eat it all up, and afterwards you ask, honey, where's all the stuff? Well, we kind of served it. Be hospitable without complaint. Give the best for your guests. Don't keep it in the closet. They'll come looking for it anyway, right? <laughs> Usually a complaint is a sinful attitude. And so maybe it is that some of the people had a sinful attitude here. Their moral case was correct. Their attitude may have not been correct. There may have been a better way of handling this. We don't know. Often the easiest thing to do when you see something going wrong is just to grumble, just to complain. Where does grumbling and complaining lead to? Listen, unless it's a... Unless it's, let's go directly to the source where we want to try to solve the problem, then it just kind of turns into a a hurtful thing in the congregation, doesn't it? Even if you are being wronged, which is very possible, it's not good to grumble. It's better to go and try to, let's get this thing fixed. Let's try to understand what's going on here. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what this other person is doing. God, in other words, would have us deal directly in love with people when we want to solve problems, not get angry, leave, put things on the internet and all the rest of that. Talk to people directly, deal with them directly face to face. Whether the attitude was good or not, we don't know. Somewhere along the line, somebody got wind of this inequity. Someone got wind of this, what would appear to be prejudicial action. So someone with more wisdom and more maturity made sure that this iniquity came up all the way to the years of the apostles. Now, remember, they can't text each other back in the day, right? So someone had to bring that message. Nowadays, we can get on electronic device. You can get any of the elders, any of the deacons, and you can communicate with them right away. But some of the people might not have felt they had that kind of access. And so there was some way that it worked up through the ranks, and it came to the ears of the apostles. And so now we come to their solution, and we'll just get started with this today in verses 2 through 4. Look at verse 2. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Almost as if they anticipated, we know where this is going. We're going to be the ones that are expected to do this. And so we see the problem, but we know that the solution to the problem is not right. And so now they bring to to bear some important wisdom for a local church. Now I'm going to stop there with verse 2. The solution to the problem begins with the leadership of the church. Do you see that? The solution to the problem begins with the leadership to the church. It is incumbent upon leaders to act and function like leaders. That's why it says in Romans 12, if you have the gift of leadership, do it diligently. So those of us who are leaders, it is important that we are proactive in understanding what is going on in the congregation and that the solution starts not from the grassroots, but the solution starts from the leadership. So it is the 12 that summon the congregation. 
The 12 is a clear reference to the 12 apostles. They're functioning not only as a group, they're functioning not only as the foundation for the entire New Testament church, but they're also functioning as the elders and the pastors of this local church. The 12 were in authority in this local church. That's important for you to understand. It shows here in chapter 6 the 12 leading the way and the people responding to their leadership. The early church was not without structure. The early church was not without authority. A lot of people today say, well, structure doesn't matter. Authority, that doesn't matter. It does matter. And we could see in chapter 6 they had structure and they had lines of communication and they had authority. So it is the, the apostles, we'll call them also the pastors, who summoned the entire congregation. This shows that the people trusted in their leadership. When they were summoned, they came. It shows that they dedicated themselves to the leadership. They followed the instructions that they were given. They were summoned. I guess there was some message that was sent out. That shows already that there were some people cooperating. It had to be distributed from house to house. There are people that took that message and said, hey, the apostles are calling for a really huge meeting, all of us together. And so the message went out. Notice the the gathering included all the disciples. Men and women were gathered together. That shows, again, the dignity of women in the church. The apostles wanted everyone together. They didn't just go to the, to the Hebrew-speaking Jews to solve the problem. Notice, he didn't, they didn't just go to the Hellenists to solve the problem. They got everybody together to solve the problem as one congregation. They made the Hebrews face the inequity that they had caused. They made them see what they had been doing in neglecting the caring for the widow. Now, the apostles, obviously, by their reaction, viewed this as no small complaint. I know you can read through the book of Acts. You could come to a story like this, like we did with the healing of the lame man. You're like, okay, so one lame man got healed. What's the big deal? But obviously, that story had a lot to do with the the apostles beginning to face persecution. It was the impetus for something greater that happened. Here, the same kind of thing has happened. Luke is not just throwing a story in there saying, oh, here's a cool story. Let me tell you about this. No, this had implications. And it was, a, it was a big deal. It was a big problem, actually, for the church. They had a minority of believers being overlooked by the majority of believers. That could not be allowed to continue. In this case, if the problem was not dealt with, can you imagine the effect of this on their overall witness to the entire Jerusalem community? Wait, you mean... You guys are taking worse care of your widows than those who are outside the church are? Why would I join you? Can you imagine the hurt from the one side toward the other side? Why do they continue to neglect us? Don't they see us? Don't they care? Don't they know that we're here? Can you see the potential for an entire church split over this issue? Of course it is. Don't think that Satan wouldn't take any spark that he could like that and fan that thing into the biggest inferno that he wanted just to break apart the church right here. A split at this early stage in the history of the church might be something that would not be repaired for centuries. Well, you could just see how Satan would want to get in there on this. And please notice that church splits happen not just because of theology, but because of practice as well. I agree with Dr. David Peterson when he writes, Christians in every age and social context need to be aware, listen to how he words this, need to be aware of the threat that cultural and racial differences can pose to their unity in Christ. We cannot bury our heads and pretend the potential is not there. It's true we're one race in Adam. We know that because we have good theology. Better yet, it's true we're one race in Christ. That's the better race, I think. But we do have our different ethnical backgrounds, languages, social settings, expectations for life. We do come to the church with those differences. And we should strive to put ourselves in the shoes of others and make sure that we're organized so that there is no difference between race. There is no difference between educational attainment or any other division that we have. 
in society. Christian practice in the church is just as important as Christian doctrine. We need to have more than orthodoxy. We need to also have what? Orthopraxy. We need to practice the Christian faith that shows we understand the Christian faith properly. Love is the proper expression of the gospel, and love is not prejudice. Notice again how the church is described. They are called the congregation of the disciples, not two congregations, one congregation. Every Christian tied to every other Christian because we're all disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We love Christ. It's what brings us together. That's who we're following, and that's why we can get along. That's the only reason why we can get along. The apostles' message to the entire congregation was, we have a problem. But the solution of the problem should not be that we solve it with our hands. That is not our calling. That is not doing what our Lord Jesus Christ commissioned us to do. We have a calling to witness the Word of God, and it is not desirable. It is not desirable that we serve these tables, since by serving these tables, we will not have time to do both that and the ministry of the Word of God. Tables. Tables were used for lots of different kinds of things. Tables were used for the money changers in the temple. It looks like the tables were set up as a place for distribution for the widows as well, and that's what they're referring to. Now, this is a very important biblical truth, and we can't merely wave at this truth that the apostles state in this passage as it passes us by and say, oh, yeah, pastors are supposed to be taking care of the Word of God. We need to understand the wisdom that the apostles communicated to their entire congregation, and I plead with you to understand it. We need to understand it still has important meaning for every local church and how we structure what happens in this church and who is responsible to do what. That matters. They did not want to neglect the Word of God. Neglect is the verb katalepo. It means to leave behind in the sense of no longer dealing with it. It's what should have been done, but it was left behind. The verb is actually used when you would leave somebody and you'd walk away from them, such as in Matthew 16, verse 4, or Matthew 21, 17. It's the word actually that's used in Mark 10, 17, when it says a man will leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife in marriage. Or a disciple in Luke chapter 5, verse 28, leaving behind everything that he had in order to follow Jesus. That's the verb that's used here. It was the concern of the apostles that they not leave behind the, the ministry of the Word of God to serve the tables. It was very important to them not to do that. So, so they have a concern, and that's clear. We have a problem in the church, but if we directly supervise this situation to make sure that the distribution is equitable and, and make sure that nobody is overlooked then we will have no choice given the enormity of the task but to leave behind this extensive teaching and preaching of the Word of God ministry that Jesus Christ gave to us. Here is an example where someone can't do two good things at one time. They're going to have to choose. They both can't be done. By the same person at the same time, it won't happen. So an evaluation has to be made. What is the priority? What is the greater need? They could try to do both, but they were wise enough to understand the enormity of the task. They would do both of them in a half-baked kind of way. Neither would be done well, and problems would multiply. So there was a need for diversification of roles in the leadership. That's what I want you to see. There was a need for the diversification of roles in the leadership. The apostles said it's not desirable, they serve the tables. Actually, that word means pleasing. 
It's referring to pleasing things to them, but also how God would not be pleased with this as well. This would not be desirable to God. This would not be desirable to us in trying to please God. Before we saw these apostles absolutely refuse to obey the highest court in Judaism, the Sanhedrin, when they directly and explicitly told them, no longer teach in the name of Jesus. They, they disobeyed that commandment. They said they had to keep on speaking the name Jesus. Now we see them refusing to do a very good ministry since it would mean leaving behind the better ministry that they were given. Now, a quick clarification. This does not mean and should not be used to mean that pastors and people in authority are above getting their fingers dirty and doing menial work. Even our Lord Jesus demonstrated his love and his care by washing the disciples' feet. He did that as an example, but he wasn't washing their feet every single day. He was teaching and preaching every single day. All leaders will need to impress on their people their own personal willingness to serve the people and to love the people and to treat the people as more important than themselves. But this does show there's a priority in ministry. What was the greater role that these apostles were called to do? Answer, the ministry of the Word of God. The Word of God, beloved. The Word of God. That's exactly what it is. It's the words that come out of the mouth of God that He wants everybody to hear and to get right. The Word of God is God's words, the message from God to man. As we have already seen, the apostles were handpicked by Jesus Christ as his spokespersons. The gravity of that job in the world was enormous. Can you imagine the weight that was on the shoulders of these apostles? There was no king, no governor, no conqueror anywhere in the ancient world alive at that time who was more important than the apostles of Jesus Christ. To be dedicated to the spreading of God's words, there is no higher honor that God can bestow on a man. Paul, speaking of his own apostleship, wrote in Titus chapter 1, verse 3, that he was entrusted entrusted with the proclamation of God's word. He knew that. He was entrusted with it. He held it as a treasure, passing on that solemn responsibility of handling accurately and preaching (coughs) thoroughly the word of God, defending the word of God. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. It is something certain men are entrusted with. They have to keep it as a trust. It is their life's calling. Not every man senses a calling like that on his life. To abandon every other career, every other job, every other means of living and focus entirely on the Word of God. That is a calling that comes to some And when it comes, that man knows he can do nothing else in his life. And so especially, even more so, for these men who were the foundation for the entire church of Jesus, the word was their concern because they were looking down through the ages and understood that there'd be people like us so many years down the road that would need to have the word and have it right. And that ministry then was for people like us now. That heavenly guaranteed task weighed heavy on their shoulders. It was their solemn duty as well as their grand privilege. Of the severity of that calling, Paul wrote to Timothy, the senior pastor in Ephesus, 2 Timothy 4.1. You know this passage, but I want you to hear it again. Paul is, is about to die And he's writing to Timothy, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom, you preach the word. 
be ready in season and out of season. Reprove the people, rebuke the people, exhort the people, and do it with great, great patience and instruction. Given the weight of this task, they had to come up with another solution to the care of their precious widows. And we'll pick up with that note next time. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of your word and pray it helps build greater wisdom and conviction in our own congregation and wisdom in the way we leaders conduct ourselves. We pray, Father, as we go to the child dedication now, Lord, that you would bless this portion of our service as we offer up the care of these children in a Christian home to you. Amen.